Hello, Tonsay, and welcome to APTN National News Weekend. I'm Daryl Stranger. Roger Bilodeau was sentenced in an Alberta court late last Friday for killing Maurice Cardinal and Jacob Sansom, two Métis hunters gunned down by Bilodeau's son in 2020. Now we have the family's reaction to the sentence. Here's Chris Stewart with that. In March of 2020, Jacob Sansom and his uncle, Maurice Cardinal, had completed a successful moose hunt near Glendon, Alberta. Roger Bilodeau told the court he believed the two men who had stopped by his driveway were scouting to steal from his property. Roger Bilodeau, with his teenage son, chased Jacob Sansom and Maurice Cardinal in his truck with speeds up to 150 kilometers an hour on rural roads. During the chase, he called his son Anthony to follow and to bring a gun. Minutes later, Anthony arrived and shot both men. They left the two men on the road to die. In May of this year, Roger Bilodeau was convicted of two counts of manslaughter. His son, Anthony, was convicted of second-degree murder and manslaughter. This past Friday, the court heard victim impact statements from several family members of Maurice Cardinal and Jacob Sansom. Emotional testimony that had several similarities in each one. Anxiety nightmares, feelings of being unsafe outside, emotions that take time to heal, if at all. Jacob and Maurice were described as family men they provided for their families and community, and their loss was devastating. Late Friday, Justice Eric Macklin sentenced Roger Bilodeau to 10 years in prison, minus time served. He was also credited extra time because of the COVID pandemic kept him in his cell longer instead of outside. He will spend six years inside prison. The family of Jacob and Maurice spoke to the media outside the court. Sarah Sansom is Jacob's widow. Ten years is, I mean, I, that I don't know what to say about, but the judge at least said what we all knew, and that was that those boys were innocent, they were chased down, and they were murdered for nothing, for nothing. Jacob and Morris were huge contributors to our entire community. And so when you serve a sentence like that, as fair as it may seem, I guess on paper, uh, two lives are gone. And this gentleman is going to serve six years. And the reality of that is sick. It's sickening. And we need to make some changes. Gina Labasseur, Jacob's sister and Maurice's niece, says negative comments online and the posting of security camera footage showing both men getting shot by some media organizations led to distress and mental anguish for the family. And the war that it has caused on the internet, the hate groups, social media, the release of this vicious video and our children having to see it, there is no peace. It's just hurt and trauma, and we're going to have to heal from our grief. Sarah Sansom was asked about her feelings towards Roger Bilodeau. I don't really have anything to say to Roger. To accept his apology? No. Um, I think for my own healing, I, I'll never, you know, like, no, but at the same time, I need to forgive to move on. And I think for healing for all of us, but that's not for them. That's for our own, for our own healing, not for their, like, to forgive them, it's not to forgive them, it's to forgive for us. Roger Bilodeau's son, Anthony Bilodeau, will be sentenced in November for his convictions of second degree murder and manslaughter. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. In U.S. political news, a Yupik woman made history in a tight race in Alaska. Mary Peltola is the first Alaskan native to sit in the U.S. Congress. She edged out former Republican Governor Sarah Palin in a special election to finish a term left vacant by the death of Representative Don Young. Coming in with 51.5% of the vote versus 48.5%, her campaign message was fish, family, and freedom. Peltola is the executive director of the Cuscoquin River Intertribal Fish Commission and served 10 years in the state legislature. 
Community safety was the top concern of members and leaders at a recent political forum, according to the chief of the Lac La Ronge Indian Band. It took place during last week's Woodland Cree Gathering in La Ronge. APTN's Leanne Sanders reports. It was the first time since before the pandemic that a cultural gathering could be held in La Ronge. Indigenous artisans and craftspeople with goods for sale and demonstrations of traditional methods of bow and paddle making, hide prep and birch bark biting and beating were showcased at the urban reserve across from the lake. Chief Tammy Cook Searson says during political meetings, talk centered on the challenges of making the community safer. The gangs, community safety, the violence in the community, um, trapping issues, um, the, the need to support the trappers, um, w being out on the land with their families, uh, the language, um, the housing issues. Um, so that, that continues to be a huge issue within our communities. The Saskatchewan government's trespass legislation enacted at the beginning of the year is at odds with the treaty right to hunt and fish. And Cook Searson says when it comes to traditional territories, First Nations need to continue asserting their rights. I think that's important for us to assert our rights too and, and to say this is what we want instead of people telling us what they think we should do like provincial governments, federal governments, we as First Nations need to continue to set um, set rules and regulations of our own. But Cook Searson says it's also important to focus on the positive things happening. We need to build on those successes, you know, even the youth hunting craft camps that we have, the land-based learning. Um, all the different successes that are happening in our communities, the graduate graduation rates, the post-secondary rates that are going up, and people getting out there, um, earning degrees, uh, trades, uh, going into the Army, the RCMP forces. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. With the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation just around the corner, plans are underway for a major event in Ottawa on September 30th. On Tuesday morning, a press conference was held in the nation's capital to talk about the event and why it is necessary. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. This year, our focus is remembering the children, the children who were taken from their families and subjected to cruel abuse in an effort to suppress the culture and traditions of Indigenous peoples. That's National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation Executive Director Stephanie Scott talking about the upcoming TRC Day. The Trudeau government is investing $4 million in 278 community projects as part of National Truth and Reconciliation Week. Part of this funding will also go to the Ottawa event and a TRC Education Week for Canadian students in grades 1 through 12. At the press conference, Ottawa Centre Liberal MP Yasser Nakvi spoke about what he sees as his role in truth and reconciliation. I'm an immigrant to this country, and therefore I'm a settler. And it is my responsibility to continue to learn about our tragic past and participate in not only learning but teaching my two young children as well. And Saskatchewan Residential School survivor Eugene Arcand talked about what survivors expect of the non-Indigenous population. We want you to know who we are. Know our names, know our numbers. And we don't want your pity. Don't think for a second that we do what we do because we want people to feel sorry for us. Those days are done. We want real reality. We want to share these truths with adults, but more importantly with young people, because that's who's going to change this country. Nunavut survivor Lavinia Brown spoke about how she managed to retain her language in spite of attending residential school. I kept my language from our grandparents. Our grandparents and our ancestors were our strong tools to survive our, our culture. Yes, I speak my language. The September 30th Ottawa event takes place right here on Le Breton Flats and will be broadcast live on APTN. Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. The federal government has approved a new vaccine to fight the Omicron variant of COVID-19. Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos made the announcement Thursday afternoon. 
The vaccine is manufactured by Moderna and approved as a booster dose for individuals 18 years of age and older. The government says it triggers a strong immune response to Omicron's BA1 variant and is also effective against the BA4 and BA5 subvariants. Duclos said a total of 10.5 million doses of the new vaccine will be delivered to provinces and territories by the end of September. And he stressed the importance of all Canadians updating their immunizations as we head into the fall months. Canada has been ahead of all other G7 countries and most other countries in the world in terms of two-dose vaccination. 90% of all adults in Canada have received two doses, but only 60% of adult Canadians have received a third dose, putting us behind all other G7 countries except for the United States. A new three-digit number is coming next fall. Dialing 988 will connect callers to mental health services and suicide prevention. The CRTC says the new number will launch November of 2023. The move brings Canada in line with the U.S., which began the service last month. But first, all regions must adapt to 10-digit dialing. Right now, some parts of Canada still use seven digits. CEO Ian Scott says 988 may save lives. If you are currently struggling with mental health issues, you can still call Suicide Canada at 1-833-456-4566. All right, it's time to step aside for a short break, but stick around. More stories still to come. Welcome back. The cannabis rush is in full swing in a Mi'kmaq First Nation on the Quebec-New Brunswick border. Weed shops and the Bank Council are figuring out what the future of cannabis looks like in Listagush. Amelia Fournier has more. Cannabis rush is like the next gold rush, right? So we're proud to see it all unfold. Cannabis shops popped up across Listigush First Nation shortly after marijuana was legalized. Outside of First Nations, Quebec regulates the distribution of cannabis. So they've, in essence, created a monopoly for their own government uh, through, through their regime. Um, we as a First Nation uh, community within the province of Quebec and, and Canada, um, you know, uh, basically left out of that whole, that, that, that whole opportunity. So Listigish residents made their own opportunity. The Band Council created its own regulatory framework. There's a search warrant that's being executed. But in January 2020, provincial Quebec officers and local police raided pot shops in Listigish due to a lack of official licenses. Store owners like Alexander Morrison lost thousands of dollars in merchandise and faced trafficking and possession charges. Since the police raid, uh, pretty much the community, well, a portion of the community pushed back against that. And uh, the next day we were granted temporary permits and ever since then the cops haven't been bothering us. Morrison, who is also a band counselor, said Smoke Shop 69 sells around 300 ounces of weed a day. You know, eventually one of our goals is to get our own 6-9 brand across First Nation communities all across Canada. And he's building the shop's own brand with his son Joey. There's what, 14, 15 shops, like all the jobs that it's bringing, all the outside money that it's bringing into the community, you know. We're putting food on the table for families, you know. Everyone's eating off of this, off of our uh, business, so it's, you know, it's great for the community. It's everyone involved, you know, not just our business, but every other dispensary in the community as well. The chief says he wants the economic bounty of the cannabis industry to create better services for the whole community. He says a more formal system is needed for the industry to give back. You know, one of our, our oldest teachings is that you have to give back, so your first catch you're supposed to give away. Uh, if you're hunting, your first you know, your first catch, you're supposed to give part of that meat away. So, um, you know, when it comes to business, that, that principle to me should still apply. Morrison said he doesn't have a problem giving back voluntarily, but he's worried having one sole distributor and more regulations could inhibit their competitiveness with nearby First Nations. They're talking about maybe having the band be a distributor for some products. I mean, if it's some products, we're okay with that, but we don't want to be limited to one supplier. That just does not make sense at all. 
Ultimately, both Gray and the Morrisons want to see a safe cannabis supply in the community. We're all for having regulations that make sense. You know, we don't want to kill our, uh, our the gains that we made. We managed to uh, <clears throat> we managed to make a, to, and create a you know a nice cannabis economy here in Listigouche. Amelia Fournier, APTN National News, Listigouche First Nation, Quebec. Now, Wednesday night, Listigouche Council passed a motion imposing a six-month moratorium on new weed regulations and community engagement on the subject. So any plans for a council-owned distribution center have now been put on hold. This summer marks the worst year on record for Chinook salmon numbers in the Yukon, but it's nothing new for First Nations in the territory who have been struggling with low salmon numbers for years. Our reporter Sarah Connors shows us how one First Nation is tackling the problem. Many decades ago, fish camps could be spotted all along the Takini River. But for most First Nations people in the Yukon, fish camps are a memory of the past. All of our fish camps are empty. There's been nobody um, fishing for a number of years. See? He jumped right there. Brandy Mays is a lands operation manager for Kwanlin Dunn First Nation. Kwanlin Dunn is one of many First Nations in the Yukon working to protect and monitor Chinook salmon. A highly valued traditional food, Chinook stocks have been in decline for around a decade. Now, in place of fish camps, there's a new fixture along the river, sonar equipment. It's looking at a new way to connect with salmon and what do the salmon need from us? You know, they've, they've given their lives to us for thousands of years and now it's our turn to like help the salmon. Just across the river, land steward Cheyenne Bradley is using sonar software to count Chinook as they travel upstream to their spawning grounds. All right, so here's a salmon. Uh, this long line that I was talking about, this is the shadow that it casts. So far, an estimated 456 fish made it past the Dakini sonar this summer, over 200 more than last year. But that number is a far cry from 1,800 fish counted in 2018. We can count 400 and something here at the sonar, but at the end of the day, all that matters is if they made it up to their spawning grounds to spawn. Sonar information is vital. It could help the DFO and First Nations make decisions about salmon conservation, like asking their citizens not to fish. I know it's a really, really hard thing to ask, but I mean, it's in dire times right now and we kind of really need to, need to let the salmon go and spawn, so. If people aren't worried, there should be. James well, McDonald is the chair of the Yukon Salmon people Subcommittee. People he says this is the salmon. worst year on record for Chinook. As of August 24th, just over 12,000 Chinook passed a sonar near the Canadian and Alaskan border, down from 31,000 fish counted last year. You know, that's a, a biological tipping point, which means we're close to losing our salmon, uh, much closer than ever before. McDonald says it's not clear why numbers continue to decline, though things like climate change, bycatch, and competition for food may be to blame. I would imagine a combination of all these different factors that have taken place over the last, uh, last decade or so. While fish camps no longer dot the Dakini River, May says it's important First Nations stay hopeful that they may one day return. I know some people are, you know, it's, they're not, they're losing hope and it's a small, a small number of salmon that are coming back, but we have, we have hope, we're optimistic. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Time for one final break, but still ahead, we'll show you one of the cutest videos we've seen in a long time. Welcome back. Long throughout history, humans have used horses for many things, including getting from point A to point B. Here's Annette Francis with a story about a program using horses to create connections on Manitoulin Island in Ontario. Put your hands on it. You wouldn't know it, but Marsha Manitowabi hasn't always worked with horses. I do one-on-one -on -one counseling with youth and children, 
and um, struggle with, you know, that one-on-one -on -one talk therapy. So um, I had a little guy who has PTSD and um, it was one-on-one -on -one just wasn't working. And so um, I sought out um, horse therapy. She says she tried it for herself first and loved it. Then the biggest test came with the little guy she was counseling. In the very first session, he was leading that horse out of all the kids. And after the program was done, my coworker was looking at me and saying, tears rolling down her eyes, did you see that? And that did it for me. And so ever since then, um, I've had a passion for this work. That session was about four years ago. That's when she decided it was something she had to learn how to do. So she found a mentor and became a certified equine assistant learning facilitator. And that's how Nandwin Wajik, Baj Gojik, or Healing Horses, and was so born. For me, my dream was bringing these horses, you know, back to our community to be able to help our people. And because I see the work that that happens, you know, it's unexplainable. And so for me, um, I'm just the vessel bringing them here. And uh, the horses are the ones who who do the work, really. And um, I get to witness it. And, that what makes it so amazing for me. In spite of the pandemic, things came together. Cash and Willow were donated to the program about a year ago, and Manitowabi is expecting more to arrive. She says, at times, it's been challenging. You know, I had a lot of people come to me at the beginning and say, you know, these horses are not ready for the program. And, you know, there was a lot of doubt in this work that I was doing. and lots of fear and so I had to work really hard to you know um, do this work build my own confidence and my own self-esteem and um, building that trust with them and so there are times when you know I just go out into in the field and I'd sing to them you know. Nicole Van Stone knows the difference that horse therapy like this can offer. It's helped her heal from her own trauma. She says it's been a powerful experience. It was the first huge um, step forward in, in healing. And the horses sometimes when they heal and they take things off of you, they roll on the ground and um, they just let that go. And so it's just a, a spiritual exchange where they take it from you and, and uh, release it back to Mother Earth. Manitowabi plans to move the horses up the road to the Oswamic Gitigani Language Ranch so language and culture can be included in the program. And at Francis APTN National News, Wikwemekong. Well, that's such a great story there. And now we'd like to share with you one of the cutest videos we've seen in a long time. This baby boy might not be able to walk quite yet, but he sure knows how to dance. Here he is with horse dancers at the Ochapaway's First Nation powwow in Saskatchewan in the past weekend. The video has over 700,000 views and over 150,000 likes on TikTok. There's obviously a good reason for that. Just so adorable. I was smiling for the entire video, as I'm sure you were as well. Well, that's going to do it for this weekend edition of APTN National News. For news anytime, visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us. Miigwech and have a great night.